Welcome, everybody. I am Dr. Steve Johnson. Today, I'm going to be talking about the REBT treatment for anxiety, depression, and anger. This is a Q&A um, session. I received questions from students, and now I'm going to be answering them for not only those students, for anyone interested in, in REBT. The topic um, is the actually the topic for this week's graduate course in short-term counseling, which focuses largely on REBT. So I'm just going to jump in to the questions that were posed, all quite good, and do my best to do justice to each and every one of them. The first question is, um, in class, they're talking about an assignment in class. In class, we had a specific case to analyze in which the client was experiencing anxiety and anger. And I said that the inference, the student was saying that they said that the inference for the client's anxiety was that there was a threat but I missed some points. What did I do wrong? Well, um, you kind of got it in a general way, but missed it in a very specific way. Um, that it is true that for anxiety, the general inference, not the specific one, but the general inference is the, press, is the presence of some kind of attribution of threat to something in the environment. However, for a very specific case and, and the, a specific situation within that case, it's important to name specifically what the client inferred as a threat. Let me give an example for this. Let's say that the client is anxious or worried about getting fired. <clears throat> the threat we find as to, in talking with the client, we find that the, the threat that the client has inferred to that uh, situation was the displeasure that he projects that he will receive from his significant partner, significant other, um, when he uh, goes home and shares the fact that um, he may get fired. Uh, notice that it's in general, it is about a threat but it is important to know specifically how that client sees that threat if we want to identify the dysfunctional uh, beliefs around that particular threat. So that's the reason why well, you may have missed some points, but you went, but only some points because you generally got the idea that the inference is about a threat, but you didn't get this very specific threat that is necessary for us when we do look at case conceptualization. The second question is, <clears throat> what are the general inferences for anxiety, depression, and anger? These are the emotions that I was covering in this week's lecture. The answer is, well, for anxiety, there is a general, um, there is the perception of a general threat to life, self-esteem or something such as that. For depression, um, the, infer um, is that, uh, the inference is that there is a significant loss of the client in some domain of that client's life. It could be a loss of health. It could be a loss of uh, the life of a loved one. It could be a the loss of a job. It could be a loss of meaning. It could be loss of purpose. It could be a loss of a friendship. Any number of losses, and we would need to know the specific loss, right? Not in, uh, but that is the general inference for um, depression is that there's been a significant loss experience. And then the um, general inference for anger is that someone or something has violated an ethical, ethical or moral principle that is important to the uh, client. These are the general inferences so remember that in a very specific case, you must determine the exact relevant content of the inference in that activating um, that is made about the uh, activating event, critical activating event. The third question is, um, again, in class, the case assigned for analysis um, 
we saw that anxiety was the primary emotion and the uh, anger was a secondary emotion. Is anxiety always going to be the primary emotion? No, absolutely not. Remember, the primary emotion is that emotion the client reports experiencing about the initially reported critical activating event. The secondary emotion in, this, in that case is the emotion the client experiences about having the primary emotion. Let's, that seems maybe um, somewhat abstract, um, but let me say a little bit and then give an example. When there is a secondary emotion, and there's not always going to be a secondary emotion, but it is important to check for the presence of a secondary emotion. But when there is a secondary emotion, the critical A for the secondary emotion is having the primary emotion. That's going to be the critical aspect of the event. So um, also, anxiety doesn't have to be the primary emotion. It is whatever the emotion that is initially experienced about the uh, initial uh, critical activating event. So uh, there could be any number of combinations here. We could have anxiety about depression. So that depression might be the primary emotion. And then we get anxious about the depression. So anxiety would be the secondary emotion. Or we might become depressed about anxiety. So we first experience the anxiety, and then we become depressed about having the anxiety. So the depression would be the secondary emotion. Or we might have anger about depression. So depression is our primary emotion. And then we may make ourselves angry about having the depression. So anger would be the secondary emotion. Or we may experience guilt about experiencing anxiety, right? So anxiety would be the primary emotion and guilt would be the secondary emotion. Guilt would be the emotion about the emotion um, anxiety. So there can be all kinds of combinations and we have to look at the specific combination of primary and secondary emotions if there is a secondary emotion in whatever the situation or the case is that we're dealing with. Um, the fourth question is, what are the action or behavioral potentials for anxiety, depression, and anger? The general uh, action or behavioral potentials are as follows. For anxiety, it would be avoidance. For depression, it would be withdrawal. And for anger, it might be attacking verbally or physically or avoiding, right? So these are general. And so in a very specific case, we would need to look for anxiety to describe the exact form of avoidance. Um, are they avoiding people? Are they avoiding um, um, going to work? Are they, you know, what, what, what are they doing? In uh, depression, it would be withdrawal. So we need to know what are they withdrawing from? Are they withdrawing from loved ones? Are they withdrawing from um, their hobbies and the things that they normally get pleasure experiencing? And for um, the anger, what are they attacking? Are they verbally attacking a particular person? Or are they just avoiding them and just won't talk to the, uh, somebody uh, or you know, won't go to a particular situation, et cetera? So what's the nature uh, of the avoidance, okay? The fifth question that was posed is for these three emotions, uh, the anxiety, depression, and anger, do we just dispute the um, inference and then dispute the um, uh, irrational or unhelpful beliefs and then help the client overcome whatever dysfunctional action or behavioral potential th that is associated with that specific emotion? No, uh, we don't just do those, <clears throat> those things. Doing those things are uh, very, very important and necessary and we should always do those as the minimal um, actions that we do within uh, therapy. Um, but there are, you know, there's just a large number of potential interventions that we can use within RDT. And actually, we tend to group those into three categories. They are the um, cognitive interventions, such as the cognitive restructuring of beliefs and inferences. 
Um, there are behavioral interventions where we uh, have the client behave in um, more adaptive rather than dysfunctional kinds of ways that the client may be engaging in, um, but engage in behaviors that will help them attain um, the, their uh, desired and valued life goals. And then we also have a whole category of interventions called emotive interventions, where we directly have the client experience the, um, the emotion under consideration, and then either learn how to sit with that emotion and without running away from it, or um, we, um, or in addition, we may also uh, work uh, to directly change that uh, emotion in various ways. And we're going to, next week, we will explore those three types or categories of interventions that exist within our MDT. And that is a three categories, but a lot of different interventions in each uh, category. So um, you'll learn more about that in a, in a week or so. The sixth uh, question that was posed is, can you give an example of how you would address the client's action or behavioral potential if that client is experiencing anxiety. Remember that the general um, uh, action or behavioral potential with anxiety is avoidance. So for example, let's say we have a client who's experiencing anxiety about driving down a busy highway and is avoiding just completely driving on the highway. They'll take back roads, et cetera, and take much more time getting to wherever they want to get because of their anxiety about driving on the highway. So we might eventually, not initially, most likely, but eventually have the client actually get out there and drive on the highway while they use the techniques that have been learned in therapy about how to, how we, how to lower the anxiety in a situation that is associated typically for that client with, uh, with anxiety. So we would call that kind of an exposure uh, therapy technique. The uh, seventh question is, if a client is experiencing um, depression <clears throat> and the action or behavioral potential for the depression is withdrawal, how would you change that behavior? Well, there are multiple, multiple ways that we can do that. But first, I would need to know exactly what is it that the client has withdrawn from? Are they, have they withdrawn from you know, uh, work? Have they withdrawn from engaging in any pleasurable activity or things that were uh, prior to the depression experienced as pleasurable? Are they withdrawing from people, loved ones? Are they withdrawing from any number of uh, maybe they're withdrawing from engaging in self-care. Um, you know, maybe they're withdrawing from taking a shower and brushing their teeth and exercising and all of those kinds of things. So I need to know the nature of the withdrawal. What kind of withdrawal are we talking about? Okay, let me give an example. Let's say that we have a client and she's uh, withdrawing from, uh, she's depressed and she's withdrawing from interacting with her uh, good friends, specifically, She's not calling her best friends when that would be a typical behavior of hers. There's not a day that goes by when she's not depressed when she is calling and spending some time talking to one of her good friends, or especially her best friends. So then uh, what we might do is then um, have her act against the withdrawal. In other words, have her at least once a day, initially maybe call one of her best friends and talk for 15 minutes, okay? And so we would um, then gradually increase the number of calls that she's making in the length of time that she's uh, talking to them, okay? So we would have her act against the withdrawal. Instead of withdrawing, we would have her engage, um, well, being engaged with other people because engaging with other people actually helps the body produce oxytocin and gives a sense of well-being and pleasure uh, for the individual and can be really helpful for them if they are uh, depressed and they're withdrawing from things, especially withdrawing from things that were previously enjoyable to them. <clears throat> uh, question number eight is, I still don't understand why anger is dysfunctional, um, but the um, um, 
because uh, isn't it normal and at times even helpful? Well, <clears throat> there's a lot in that uh, question, that statement. Um, and so let me go through some of them. I don't know if I'll be able to give an exhaustive address of each of them, but one, remember that we don't focus on the word anger, but we focus on the reality of the emotion that the individual is experiencing, regardless of what label they give to that emotion. So <clears throat> if they're, um, let's say they've labeled their emotion as anger, well, we need to assess whether that emotion that they're calling anger is dysfunctional or functional. And the only way to know whether it's dysfunctional or functional is to look at the consequences of having that emotion. When they have that emotion that they call anger, does that tend to get in the way for them to attain uh, desired life goals on the job, at education, interpersonally, spiritually, whatever? Is it helping to attain those goals or is it getting in the way? If it's getting in the way, that emotion called it, that the client is calling anger is dysfunctional. If it's not getting in the way, what the client is calling anger is functional. And so we will have to do an assessment regardless of whatever the label is that the client gives to that emotion. <clears throat> so the other thing is we might want to determine if it is, um, if it's dysfunctional, we might call it anger or rage or whatever. If it is functional, we tend to call it annoyance or righteous indignation. <clears throat> That's from an REBT perspective, but we do not impose those labels on the clients. That's why. Uh, whatever label they use, that necessitates that we actually do an assessment for functionality or just functionality of that uh, emotion. Let, let me give an example. Let's say that um, <clears throat> I'm looking around uh, what's going on around me in my environment, and I notice what I deem to be a violation of the civil rights of particular individuals, particular groups of individuals in my, uh, in my environment, in my, in, my, uh, in my culture. And let's say I'm not happy about that. So I go out and I protest and I protest vigorously. I donate my time, my money to protesting. I can be loud um, about in my protest and just do it repeatedly, okay? Um, but it's not getting in the way of my life. And I'm not violating anybody else's rights by my, uh, by my protest. However, um, so I would say that's an adaptive protest. It's not uh, harmful in any way. However, let's say that um, I have that same inference, but what I do is that I go out and I burn and destroy property that doesn't belong to me, that I uh, harm people. I, let's say I'm beating them up or setting fire to, you know, to their um, car or whatever, that is dysfunctional. That is not um, functional behavior. And so that one might um, necessitate or warrant at least uh, treatment, whereas the uh, righteous indignation of the first uh, wouldn't necessarily warrant any treatment what, uh, whatsoever. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the ninth question is, uh, how do you treat a client who believes their dysfunctional emotion is justified and normal? <clears throat> this is going to be pretty common, really pretty common, especially with anger, um, but sometimes with other emotions uh, too, kind of, uh, for example, hurt, or, uh, shame, etc. One, normalize the emotion. All of these emotions are normal because statistically a lot of people experience them. So statistically, they're normal in that sense of normal. But we assess, it, so affirm and normalize the, the emotion that the client is having to the, emo, to the client, but assess whether it is helpful or unhelpful for the client. And that we determine uh, by talking to the client. And, um, and if the client wants to work on 
for example, unhelpful aspects of whatever that emotion is, we can <clears throat> help them with, uh, with that. One thing that often when a client comes in and they're feeling something very, very deeply, and if they do believe that they're justified in that emotion, um, <clears throat> and that's what they're focusing on rather than whether it's helpful, it may take time for them to get to know us better, to trust our judgment and for them to realize that we are acting as best we can in their best interest based upon their values and their goals in life. So we may just, it may just take some time to build some trust. And the other thing is honor their process. There is no set process and time limit for an individual to come to a realization that maybe they, it would be better and in their best interest to change an emotion. And so one of the things we do is we practice REBT and embrace the unconditional acceptance of this other person, regardless of whatever emotions they are experienced, whether helpful or um, unhelpful. The same goes with their behavior, behaviors. Question number 10 is, if a client is anxious about doing something, why don't we as therapists just tell them to avoid doing it? Well. I, you know, I know that feeling. I go, well, you know, if you want to avoid it, just go ahead and do it. Just, you know, uh, why, why, why uh, treat them for this? Well, there are really good reasons why we wouldn't do this. And one is, um, if we take that attitude and take that approach, we are really not helping them change when that change might be much more helpful for them. And because by changing that anxiety, to maybe concern or something else, they may have greater control over their life and over their emotions <clears throat> and not be so driven by their emotions. Another reason why we probably wouldn't do what uh, this individual is asking is um, the anxiety or the avoidance of the individual's experience about a given a critical activating event uh, may be uh, generalized to other situations. And if that attitude and that approach is, um, is being generalized in situations that really are important to the individual, then our attitude of just, you know, just to avoid it may not be the best, uh, may not be the best approach. <clears throat> because then over time that could chip away at the freedom of that individual as their life becomes smaller and smaller and smaller because of their avoidance. <clears throat> If my client is a parent and they are avoiding all kinds of things due to their anxiety, that gets modeled to their children. And that may not be the best example to set for our children. When there is a situation that we infer as a threat, the best thing to do is just avoid, avoid, avoid. That you know, may not help them become um, successful in, uh, in life. It's understandable. And if a parent's doing that, we don't put them down. We're not going to be negative about them that we may just say, look, that might be an issue that we want to look at about uh, <clears throat> uh, how we can let the child know that in a way that's appropriate to their understanding what you're going through emotionally, not overload them, but state it in, in an age appropriate way, and then um, let them know that you're working on that. And, um, and let them know, and in that sense, it gives them help and hope uh, that things can change. <clears throat> the 11th question, excuse me. The 11th question was, doesn't REBT reinforce avoidance of dysfunctional emotions by having the client change them to functional emotions? I love this question. This is a fantastic, fantastic question. And I don't think it does contribute to avoidance. And I'll, here's the reason why. Because when a client comes in and they're having a deeply painful or dysfunctional emotion, one of the things that we will try to assess is whether they have frustration and tolerance about having that emotion. So for example, if the client is experiencing uh, depression, I wanna see whether they believe that they absolutely can't stand this depression. That would be having frustration and tolerance about the depression, which would make the situation even worse. It might even contribute to another secondary emotion. So now they have to deal with two dysfunctional emotions 
rather than just having depression. Depression can be enough in its own right. So <clears throat> we want to assess the functionality. We assess for the, I'm sorry, assess for the presence of any unhelpful or irrational belief, or particularly frustration and tolerance around that, um, around that uh, emotion. And then uh, help the client kind of sit with that emotion um, and realize that it's tolerable, it's not pleasurable, it's not fun, it's not enjoyable in any way, but prevent them from running away from it without acknowledging it and then doing something about it, okay? So it is important that we help them overcome their frustration and tolerance about having that, <coughs> excuse me, dysfunctional emotion. Then if we work on that and the client wants to change the emotion, then of course we're going to help them. But let's say the client says, I don't want to change it. I don't want to change my depression. I, 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 I like um, experiencing depression at times. It is uh, just, it's kind of the way I am, although I may disagree with that, but um, it is their right as a client. And if that's their goal, they don't want to change it, but that they don't want a secondary emotion about it. They don't want to beat themselves up about having that emotion. They want to be accepting of the self having their depression and fine. We can work on how not to beat the self up, how they can have unconditional self-acceptance even in the face of their depression, okay? So if they wanna change it, we can help them. They don't wanna change it and they want to accept it and not fight against it, we can help them though with that. The client will decide the goal and we can collaborate with them to look at what the consequences are of whichever way they want to go. But ultimately, they are the one that decides the uh, psychotherapy goal there. Question number 12 is, um, <clears> this <throat> kind of a religious question. It's interesting. We haven't had anything like this. In my church, we are taught that when we have any painful emotion, all we need to do is um, to uh, pray about it. Is that okay? Well, let me just say right up front that REBT is not against any uh, religious beliefs or, or practices. <clears throat> um, that is not for us to uh, say that a, a client should have those religious belief or engage in those religious practices. <clears throat> uh, so, so example, REBT would say, you need to quit praying. Now, in fact, what that was this, uh, my area of research when I was I first went to the Albert Ellis Institute and uh, was mentored by Albert himself, he had me work on um, for clients who were deeply religious and found prayer to be really important, as this question is um, talking about, how could we help them use REBT in their prayer life to make for really powerful prayers? And so one of the things I worked on was incorporating the ABC model into the prayer, whether it's Christian, Jewish, Muslim, whatever, <clears throat> how we could do that, or if it's meditation, how to incorporate the ABC model in, in that. And we found with some research studies that that actually uh, improves a, a client's uh, mood. And uh, um, for example, if they're highly anxious, sometimes uh, having them pray with an REBT structured prayer actually lifted their um, anxiety and in some cases even eliminated it. So um, you may have heard uh, some rumors that REBT is anti-religion. Al Berdellis initially, early in his life, was very, very negative about religion. But by the time I was working with him, he was very open and saw the important aspects of, of religion. Um, if an individual um, was not overly dogmatic and rigid about it and demanding that everybody else agree with them. Okay. But so, um, we believe that, um, you know, and we practice in REBT to honor whatever uh, religious beliefs or ethical beliefs, um, religious practices of the client, you know, we're not going to necessarily try to change those for the client just in, unless, they, unless they want to, right? Uh, question number 13 is, what if a client is court ordered to enter therapy to treat anger, but doesn't believe that 
<clears throat> he or she has a problem. How do you motivate them? Well, this, this is actually a really good question and it is an issue when we are dealing with court-ordered clients. Um, whatever, one of the things that I try to do with a client that is in court order to get anger, um, anger uh, treatment is to um, help the client realize that <clears throat> the result of the behavior that they exhibited due to their anger resulted in being ordered by a court to come in and spend time when they could be using that time to do something that might be far more enjoyable to them. So they've already lost freedom as a result and as a consequence of their behavior that they exhibited due to their anger. Now, here, do they want to do something? The question is, do they want to do something about it? Sometimes it's good to look at whether the client is intrinsically motivated to change it or extrinsically motivated. If they're intrinsically motivated to change the anger, that means they want to change the anger just because that's important to them. But if they're extrinsically motivated, it's not because they want to, but it's because um, if they uh, get treat treated for the anger, then they get some goodies attached to that. Like they don't have to be in therapy with me, right? Or something of that of something in that nature. So whether they're intrinsically motivated or extrinsically motivated, and I determine that, then I can work with, uh, with them. If they're extrinsically motivated, it may be, be a bit more challenging, but they are at least motivated. I have never found a client that is utterly unmotivated. They're always motivated about something. So I need to find out what they are motivated about and see if we can begin to use of that. I think another thing that is really important, and this is an overlap of REBT and what's called motivational interviewing and um, readiness models for change, trans, uh, trans theoretical models <clears throat> um, would be for us to assess how ready this client is to change. Uh, all the way from, they don't believe they have a problem at all. They don't acknowledge that there's any problem whatsoever. So they're not ready for change. Um, and so we will work with, you know, we work with, uh, with them at that level, looking for changes in the language of openness or some awareness or a different level of awareness or readiness for change. So then maybe they acknowledge that they do have a problem, maybe that their anger is a problem, but they don't see it as pervasive, it's very limited, and so they don't think that it warrants actually doing anything about it. Maybe they open up a little bit more than they realize that it would be in their best interest to change because it's causing some negative consequences in other areas of, our, of their life that are really important to them. And so um, then that we could work with them at that level. So whatever level of readiness they have, we work at whatever the beliefs are at that level of readiness, the inferences and beliefs at that level of readiness, and the action potential at that level of readiness, and then we can work with that in the, in the therapy. Um, another thing that I think is really important is to explore what the ultimate values are for that particular client. Maybe, um, maybe with this anger, we find that one of the really important values for this individual is to have close, intimate friendships with individuals that they really like. But we might look at how that anger and the behavior associated with that anger sometimes sabotages those relationships. So it's in violation with something that they hold dear, that value. So if we keep them, look, how can we attain this value you know, and have you act consistent with that transcendent value, then maybe we get some more traction and openness with the client. So I always check for those ultimate values. Question, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> Question 14 is if a client, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Question 14 is if a client is very depressed, do you do anything else other than work with their influences, beliefs, and um, uh, behavioral potential? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm glad you asked this question. It is always important if a client presents with depression and sometimes other emotions, such as really 
um, uh, intractable anxiety or something. It is very important to do a complete suicide assessment. I always do that when I have a client who is depressed because uh, suicide can be highly associated, uh, correlated with um, uh, depression, uh, different forms of depression. So I will do a complete suicide assessment. I will, if the client gives me permission, written in writing, uh, talk to significant others to get their sense of what's going on with the client when their client is feeling really, really down. Um, I will do a, a, in the history that I take with that client, one thing that I will definitely look at is any prior history of suicidal ideation, suicidal thoughts, and uh, attempts or practices at, at suicidal behavior or parasuicidal behavior, et cetera, uh, driving very, very recklessly, et cetera. I will check for the presence of those. And of course, any suicide attempts, what was how the, um, how, what was the situation? What was going on? What were the means that they used for the suicide attempt? And then I'm also going to assess for real issues that may impact um, uh, suicidal ideation and, and a suicidal attempt. What I need to ins uh, assess for impulsivity. Uh, if the client acts very impulsively, that's, that can be problematical. If they have a drug or alcohol problem, um, that can be um, very significant. If they've had a recent, very significant loss within their life, there's a family history of, of suicide attempts or actual success uh, suicide. If they've experienced some major recent health problems or the, their health is just significantly declining and they're beginning to lose hope and a lack of meaning or purpose in life, I definitely need to assess for that. You know, I want to assess for the level of their self-care. Do they take care of themselves? Do they eat? Do they enough sleep? Do they um, exercise? You know, any whatever the level of self-care is. And are they good about mood management? Have they learned the skills to manage their moods? Or do they have difficulty, um, they act very, very strongly to events and significantly become depressed um, in, um, you know, about, uh, <clears throat> about events, et cetera. So yeah, there are many things that we do when an individual is experiencing depression. We don't just do, um, you know, the cognitive conceptualization on them. Um, the last question is, should we do a DSM-5 based diagnosis or just an RUT conceptualization of emotion? <clears throat> Good question. We do both. Um, what, we do the DSM-5 uh, because it's for several reasons. One, it can be necessary if the client wants to get um, insurance paid to pay for the sessions, or <laughs> it can be helpful uh, to have a vocabulary, a, a universal vocabulary for mental health care um, providers, uh, mental health care providers and other physicians or uh, individuals who care for the individual to be on a common, to use some common language. Um, the DSM is good for, uh, for that. It's also important because not all mental health uh, providers do practice RABT and so um, they won't know necessarily what the REBT jargon is and what that means. And so at least we can use DSM-5 um, uh, um, language to discuss, so again, that type of common language that we can use to communicate. The conceptualization of, uh, of emotions in REBT is tremendously important because um, one, the DSM doesn't is agnostic toward treatment plan. It doesn't even give recommendations for treatment, whether evidence-based or non-evidence-based. It doesn't look at that. It just is a diagnostic tool, not it. It doesn't give a recommend, it doesn't give any idea about what the treatment would be for that. That information we need to get elsewhere. And uh, that one of those elsewheres is in, uh, in RBT, we are able to conceptualize and treat. That's what we are focusing on with the conceptualization of emotion and um, assessment that we do about the emotions and behaviors and physiological responses of our, of our clients. Um, <clears throat> so DSM is, has very limited value in terms of developing the treatment plan. But 
what the DSM-5 does, even though I may have some major disagreements with the DSM-5, what it can do is, in its comprehensiveness on a particular syndrome, may give me ideas about other areas that I need to check out. So for example, often in the DSM-5, it may give, um, you know, talk about co-occurring disorders or commonly associated disorders, and maybe guides me in assessing the level of severity of, of what the client's symptoms are, et cetera. So it can be very helpful in, in, that, in that way because it is grounded in empirical evidence and statistical evidence in terms of, uh, of the prevalence of a particular condition. So I think it's important in that way. So I think, remember, DSM-5, there's a big difference. The DSM-5 focuses on syndrome, diagnosis, major depressive disorder, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, borderline personality disorder, um, Alzheimer's, uh, <clears throat> uh, autism spectrum disorder. So we have these uh, syndromes that are, are covered. And, um, and in RBT, we don't treat syndromes. We treat symptoms. So. Uh, depression is a symptom made up of a bunch of observable actions and attitudes and you know etc so we look at symptoms and we treat the symptoms and we can look to see whether this, there's any symptom alleviation whether they're staying the same or even getting worse so um, we're not about treating syndromes now <clears throat> when we treat those symptoms that may change what the dsm-5 diagnosis is of a syndrome but we, you, you can't treat a syndrome because a syndrome is an abstraction. The only real, the only reality are the symptoms. So we can do something um, with that. So thank you all for a very, very interesting set of questions. I hope you found that um, helpful and um, that um, we, um, that you um, uh, join us uh, next week when we have that. Thank you again.